everybody, welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. In this episode, Tiffany Wang, partner at MS and AD Ventures, an early stage venture fund backed by one of Japan's, and the world's, largest insurance groups, shares with us the stages of her career, and how this has shaped her investment approach. Tiffany is passionate about investing in big market bets that positively impact humanity and was voted as one of the emerging leaders in corporate venture capital in 2021 and 2022. Most recently, Tiffany has been named Women of Influence by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. And now, please welcome Tiffany Wang, partner at MS and AD Ventures. Welcome, Tiffany. Great to have you on the show here. Your partner with MS and AD Ventures in Silicon Valley. So we're working with a little bit of a time zone difference here. Uh, it's good morning for me and good afternoon for you. Thank you so much, Norbert. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Very excited about going to visit Tokyo next week. Hopefully everything works out and I'll, I'll be there. It's wonderful. And so before you come here, we can have a bit of an education for everybody as to what MS and AD is and what you do as part of Ventures and your investment approach. For sure. So MS and AD Group is a large Japanese insurance conglomerate uh, and MS and AD Ventures. We have one sole LP. They back our fund. We're basically an early stage global fund focused on seed and series A. Uh, we make investments all over the world, uh, with the exception of Japan. So we'll do insure tech, fintech, mobility, digital health, impact, climate. We're mainly looking for unique data sets that potentially can touch financial services or insurance, which is a lot of different things. We've been around for about three and a half years and have over 75 companies in our portfolio to date. And yeah, we have investments in Israel and U.S., scattered throughout Europe, you know, Middle East, just sort of all over the place. As a CVC, have you still structured it in the shape of funds? Do you treat them as cohorts and measure performance for them as like fund one, two or, or three, like you would do mm -hmm. as a VC? Yeah, so we're currently deploying out of fund three and, you know, we're wrapping up board meetings to raise fund four. What I really love about MS and AD and, and one of the reasons why I joined is you get the best of both worlds. So we're structured like a normal institutional VC. All the decision making stays within my team. There's two other partners, there's three partners. We make the decisions. That's how we move really quickly. On the flip side, we also have the backing of a very large corporation, which is Mitsui Sumitomo and Iwani Doa. really just having the best of both worlds. And Emerson AD has a presence in about 50 different countries. And that's why we make investments everywhere. Do you then measure your performance purely financially or are there non-financial measures where you say we want to invest in companies that actually make MSAD more efficient, allows them to issue new products, etc.? Absolutely. So both is very important. So what we believe is that a financially sound startup is going to be also ones that, you know, it needs to be financially healthy in order to stay alive and give great strategic return. But we know where the capital comes from. So both strategic as well as financial returns are equally important. So what I find with this type of arrangement often, so while you have a certain strategy that comes with the funds or a certain capital allocation, if there's a really, really good opportunity that you're convinced of and you convince the headquarters of because they have such a large balance sheet, they can open the coffers and you can go beyond the initial fund allocation, right? We have had a couple of companies that, you know, our initial fund, fund one was only 40 million, fund two was 80, and I think fund three is another 80. And so, you know, there are times where like we can't write very large checks out of our funds, but we definitely have passed a bunch of the later stage investments over to headquarters to write bigger checks. And we're, you know, we're in discussion, potentially seeing what we can do for the later stage, but that's early in discussion. But for sure, headquarters can write much bigger checks. And when that happens, how is that going to be managed? Is this still becomes part of your startup portfolio or does headquarters and also have a greater say into how they want to run the investment? We haven't done tons, but so far, if we've invested in the early, like earlier round, like for instance, we have a company in Singapore called Caro. We did an early stage check and then we passed it on to headquarters and then headquarters wrote a, a bigger check. And so we're managing it from different angles, but working together. 
Insurance is super interesting. As you said at the start, there's so many tangential industry that have an impact on how we could view insurance or how we sell insurance or how we support policyholders when it comes to health, for example. So you're not a born insurance professional, let's say. You've become one over the last three and a half years, but also your path into venture capital was maybe not entirely traditional. So can you talk a bit about your path and how you then ended up in venture capital? Happy to share more about that. Well, I grew up in a family of small business entrepreneurs. My family had migrated from Taiwan to the U.S., but I was born and raised in San Francisco. So I've always believed in like just trying and doing new things. And, um, you know, sometimes people build businesses out of necessity. Like that was what a lot of people did when they first migrated to the U.S. And so going in with that mentality, I was all about learning interesting new things. When I started out, I was doing biochemistry research and I was working in a lab. And I did that for a little bit. And then I realized that, you know, I didn't really want to be in a lab for the rest of my life. And then I just moved into being a case manager. Actually, I taught first grade in between for a few years, which is a little bit different. It was like one of my dream jobs. And then after so long, you're just like, okay, I can only talk to seven year olds for so long. Moved into economic and workforce development and did case management work. Really loved it. But what I found is that there was always more people who needed help than I could help. And it was very difficult to scale. So I wanted to go to B school. But, you know, my new boss at that time just really didn't like me. And he didn't want to write a recommendation for B school for me. He was like, I don't believe in it, which is kind of ironic coming from a goodwill. So I just had to jump in and, and learn on my own. And the great part about being in Silicon Valley was like there was a lot of different people who was just very open about ideas. So as long as you're willing to learn, you're able to just sort of find the right people and start building things. I learned very basically how to code and I realized I didn't want to become a developer. I found this group called The Alchemist, which is a early stage enterprise accelerator. Very early on, it was actually an entrepreneurship training program for technical founders. And I went in there and just met a bunch of really great people, figure out how to support them with their startups, but also got access to some of the best mentors in Silicon Valley. And that's how I jumpstart my tech career. I mean, it was run by a VC. I then was recruited by this other program called European Innovation Academy to help them build out their entrepreneurship training program. Started in Estonia, then went to France, Portugal, then Qatar, just like all over the world and spent some time building out that program and then did more operational work. Eventually got picked up by Singtel Group, which is a very large Singaporean telco conglomerate. And there I got, you know, a lot of really great training and mentorship to build very large businesses, especially in Southeast Asia. So it was Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, as well as Australia. And then from there, got put onto the ventures team. So I was able to work with a lot of earlier stage startups, you know, a bunch of them sub 10 million in revenue and working in like cybersecurity networks, infrastructure. And then afterwards, I went broader and started to work with a, a few more groups and started to also do like healthcare and gaming, for instance. After about five years there, one of my partners was leaving. And so I was starting to look around and met my partners at MSNAD. And they said, hey, you know, we do early stage. And it's like, you never hear of like a corporate doing early stage. True to what they're saying, you know, I, I moved over, just been doing tons of early stage deals. We've also done a little bit of late stage as well. And what was very much aligned was our core values of taking some of the things that we're doing, making the world better, which is very much aligned with the value system of MSNAD group. So that also explains how you ended up with a Japanese company as a mothership. Now, Singtel is a very fascinating beast in its own right. It's the largest telco, probably still. I haven't looked at the numbers more recently, but last time I checked was like 700 million subscribers or so. Do you think actually in terms of the approach and the breadth, as we said, insurance has so many touch points across other industries. If you use telco as a platform, there's basically also no limit as to the industries that you could invest in, right? So maybe there's a common thread in there that we can weave through your career. I think that is definitely the common thread. When I moved into venture and corporate innovation, it was one of the jobs that actually kept me for a very long time. I used to switch jobs every two years or so because I would get bored. Like I'll learn how something works and then it's like, I'm going to go find something to learn something new. With venture capital, with corporate innovation, it's always learning something new. For instance, we've been looking at Web3 blockchain stuff. I've been looking at that for quite some time, right? And like when I moved over here, it's always about staying one or two steps ahead. I know that the questions from the executives will come about a certain topic. It just takes a while to maybe bubble up to the executives. But I always try to train and get my team to be like up and running and understanding some of the technologies a little bit earlier before the executives ask. And that's part of the fun of corporate innovation. 
And then regionally, it's of course very different talking about ASEAN on the one side and then Japan on the other. How would you compare and contrast the two regions from the perspective of your investment activity, but also from startups entering these markets? I think there's two pieces to it. When I was doing tech scouting for a telco organization versus an insurance organization, one of the biggest shockers for me was how little technology was being used in insurance. Originally, I thought it was maybe this was the MSNAD thing, but after spending you know a lot of time in insurance, I realized like this was pretty true across the board. A lot of insurance companies are now spinning up engineering teams and figuring out how to become more tech enabled. But when I first started, it was a really big shocker for me. Even when I did find technologies, they wouldn't quite understand it. In terms of key differences, I've been very lucky to work all over the world. And I think Japan is a very unique country and a unique culture, like a lot of different cultures. But it's one of the, I think, the most difficult cultures to be able to penetrate. But they're very kind. And I think that's also part of the fun and what I love about doing international business. In Singapore, so Singapore and Australia, where Singtel had a very large presence, minimally everyone spoke English. For doing tech scouting for a Japanese organization, not everyone in the company would actually speak English. Uh, with that said, MSN AD has a very large presence all over the world. So they have even in Singapore and Southeast Asia. So there's plenty of teams that do speak English, but the core like headquarters, there's definitely people who speak English, but also a, a lot of people who don't. But the understanding of English and Japanese is only one layer. There's also the cultural differences, right? It's like what they say and what they really mean. And I think that is something that takes a little bit of time to adjust to. If you've invested in something that has a use within the larger group, is there an approach where you see this is a good catalyst in distribution or manufacturing, the, the policies? Because of the level of understanding and maybe also the speed of movement, you take advantage of deploying it actually outside of Japan within the group in a subsidiary, prove it there, and then move it to headquarters and mitigate the risk of implementation through that staged approach? It depends. Because we have investments all over the world, and we also have different people with different risk tolerances. There's one or two groups in Japan that happens to be able to move really quickly, right? and I love working with that unit. There are some groups where maybe it's a little bit easier to integrate maybe in Singapore or in Europe to go to market to Europe first. So it depends. There isn't a strict rule of whether I would go to one place versus another first. With that said, sometimes we invest in very, very early companies and we definitely recommend they don't go to Japan right away because Japan is extremely difficult to penetrate. Ideally, you have enough funding so then you can hire some local staff, which isn't always the case. For the very, very younger ones, we think go after lower hanging fruit first. Like if you're a U.S. company, you know, go and find a couple more U.S. customers. It's a little bit more natural maybe to go to Singapore, Australia or London because, you know, they're English speaking places versus going to Japan. But sometimes if the technology is like very unique and they can serve Japan, then you figure out how to make it work. But typically to take a company to go to Japan, you want to go a little bit on the later stage. When we look at this insure tech space in a very broad sense, what are the hot things that you're currently looking at? So when I joined MS and AD three years ago, and it was quite a big learning curve, every insure tech was talking about cutting out their brokers and agents. But today it's like different, right? Today, it, a lot of startups found is like it's actually quite expensive and difficult to distribute insurance. So we're seeing a lot of insure techs actually selling through brokers and agents. That's one trend. The other trend is the embedded model, right? So now more and more of these tech companies and actually insurance companies are learning how to integrate. And we're seeing a lot more of that. And you almost have to nowadays because it's no longer 2021, right? Now people are looking at loss ratios and revenues and everything's become a key component of like whether you can fundraise or not. And so outside of the immediate insure tech space, if you look at health, for example, any observations there? What we really like as a firm in general is we like the convergence of a couple of different sectors. One of our portfolio companies, Paceline, is a convergence of health and wellness as well as fintech. And they are also building an insurance product. And again, that goes back to the embedded model. But we're seeing like, you know, such a massive ramp up of users there. Those models are very interesting for us. We're spending a lot of time just being very open minded because we don't want to be like, hey, we're looking for this when actually something that's being created is something that maybe we haven't really thought about. 
I think you said you have 75 portfolio companies. So is there something that can be leveraged across these or where you say actually one company has a great idea, the other has another good idea, but the combination of both would be greater than the sum of the parts and we should actually bring that thing together as a platform? It's really nice because our portfolio companies are starting to grow up. We tend to go a little bit earlier, but they're now growing up and you're, we are starting to see some integration. So we have Socotra, which is an insurance infrastructure platform, and then Geosite, which is a data platform, come together and they've recently announced a integration. And so now you can use the data from Geosite and, and put that together with Socotra for different potential insurance use cases. And so, yes, we are definitely seeing more and more of our portfolio companies bundle some of the products together. When I look across the fintech universe, what you find in more like say the banking related banking payments, many of the startups are actually regulated, they, the regulated businesses, which, which always is harder in insurance because the capital requirements are so high. And so I feel that many of the pure insure tech startups are more software companies, software providers, rather than regulated insurance businesses, right? Do you also have investments in, let's say, neo carriers rather than neo banks, to use the same terminology? I think they might be called like MGAs or MGUs, depending on if you talk to an official lawyer or not. Um, yeah, we do. And some of them, they grow up to be full stack insurance, right? I think you have to start somewhere. And usually it's some sort of, distrib it could be a distribution play, or you have some unique data set that can be used for underwriting. And I think those are some of the more common conversations with a couple of our startups, whether it makes sense to go and do the MGA route or not. Today, the bar to become a successful MGA is very, very high. So it's going to be much more difficult for you to raise a loan as a pure MGA compared to like three years ago. And so now there's much higher expectations. So it's like, do you actually want to go through the M MGA route? Why? What is the unfair advantage? You know, is there something else that you're doing that might make a lot more sense? So yeah, we're definitely open to it and we like those and we, we have plenty of MGAs in our portfolio, but with so many of them like churning out and it comes down to like, is it good risk? Japan in particular, is the whole market is prone to natural disasters. We get them regularly already and are probably still waiting for the next big earthquake, which has multiple components. And one is concern around ESG. Let's not make the storm occurrences or so more frequent. So that could be an angle. And the second is also just the pure magnitude. If you look at some of the estimations, if there was a Tokyo earthquake, the number of claims that would have to be pro Process. So there's, it's more an operational aspect, right? Can, what, what can be done to make this more efficient so that we actually get money into the hands of the policyholders so they can rebuild their lives? That would be of a domestic interest, I think. Is that something that transpires in your considerations and portfolio as well? Yeah, and we actually look at it from all over the world, uh, not just Japan. Uh, yeah, we do understand that there's a lot of risk in Japan. We not only want to do quicker payout, the other thing is we want to prepare people better for disasters to prevent as much as possible, right? It's like whether it's like moving something to a certain place or like don't build something there or doing a lot of preventative care. We're about building a resilient lifestyle, whether it's a building or a structure or a human or a family unit or, or even pets, right? What are some of the things that we can really do from a preventative care perspective so that the bad thing doesn't actually happen or when it does happen, the impact is not as big. Insurance is like one of these places where like, I think people don't exactly like love insurance, right? When I joined and I started to learn more about insurance, I was like, what would we need to do to make insurance better for the world? And when you look at it from that lens, it's really like, you know, people feel like, oh, insurance is such a ripoff. It's not doing anything. How do we actually figure out how to build a product where insurance is doing something? Insurance is providing a lot more value to you. So we spend a lot of time having discussions and looking at technologies that could potentially do that. Maybe give some examples of the companies that you have in your portfolio where you think that they make insurance actually a positive experience. Actually, it doesn't have to be I love insurance. It could be how do we get humans what they need even without insurance? I'll give you an example. We invested in a company called Blueberry Health. It's basically a pediatric telehealth solution. And this is in the U.S. They were able to get the cost of care to less than $20 or so a month. And so you have unlimited access to pediatric care on an app, 
right, instantaneously. In the U.S., I know the coverage in Japan is a little bit better, but in, in the U.S., the coverage is quite terrible. When I was talking to the founder, he says, I want to make pediatric care a utility, just like internet and electricity. I want everyone to have access to care. So he was able to do this without insurance, without insurance. Ironically, now insurance companies want to work with him because by using them and doing the preventative care, it actually drives down the cost of insurance. It's really inclusion and with banking and payments, we talk a lot about financial inclusion and yeah. this is the inclusion along a different dimension that is no less important. We spend also a lot of time thinking about financial inclusion. We have another portfolio company called Share. They allow users to share basically their credit. And one of the insurance products that they had built is like, it's for migrant workers. It started in Dubai, but you know I think they're in over a hundred countries. If for instance, you're working in a different country, that's not your home country. And like something happens to you and you die and you need to get your body back home. Most of the people, if you have to leave your country to work something somewhere else, probably can't afford that. You know, Cher had built an insurance product that enables you to be able to get the body of your loved ones back home. I think traditionally a lot of insurers don't want to, like it, it would fall into the not very good risk, right? But we're like, hey, is there a way where we can figure something out to collect enough information or data to create some sort of insurance product around this that actually supports people who might not be, you know, fit into these perfect boxes of good risk? There's always been these statistics about the protection gap in insurance. And of course, the insurers would like to close that gap is my, means writing more insurance policies. Often we think about this also in developing countries where insurance is maybe not that much present, but with your example also about the pediatric care, in the same way you have unbanked population, you have uninsured population even in developed countries. And when you look at these markets across the globe, what is your focus and where is the greatest opportunity that can be reasonably tapped? So is there an easier to tap opportunity in the uninsured markets in the developed world because maybe they'll have a higher dollar value or is it the millions or tens, maybe hundred millions of people in the developing world that growing into the middle class and buying insurance for the first time maybe? Actually, when I was younger and when I first started in venture, my partners wanted me to stay focused. I was in North America, don't go outside of your box, you know. It's very understandable, right? Because before the advice used to be like, if you see something interesting, go find the Silicon Valley version. Let's do that, right? But inside, I have always felt like there could be like really good entrepreneurs all over the world. We had invested in this company. It's a, it's a Singaporean-based company called Multiplier. And, but essentially, they allow you to hire employees from all over the world and make it very, very easy to set people up. I think it was also like from a timing perspective, it was always really great too, because they started to get very, very popular right when COVID hit. So it was like suddenly people didn't know what to do. People didn't know how to hire. People now can also move and work everywhere. And so we don't care so much about like where the company is started. I mean, you know, we wanted to have terms that make sense and we understand. But whether it comes from Germany, whether it's in Singapore, or whether it's in U.S. And, you know, I, when, when I go visit to Japan, I'm really hoping to find more like global companies out of Japan. You can actually build a product from anywhere in the world now today to serve anywhere else. And we do have a couple of our companies that are global first, which was not accepted that much like 10, 20 years ago. 10, 20 years, it was like, go penetrate U.S. and then go after, you know, the next English speaking market. Right. And that's still true for some products. But there's also a space for these other products to pop up. We also invested in for our first Web3 company called Poco Fund. They're doing the legal aspects for the governance of DAOs. Even the people who are part of these DAOs are distributed everywhere. And so what possible product can you create for this group of people? You brought up now Web3. The other one is the metaverse. What does insurance look like? Is insurance going to be sold through the metaverse, let's say? So we are spending some time looking at that. We've been tracking a lot of the companies in this space, but there's also a lot of pockets of like potential value, right? Be because behind everyone who owns a crypto wallet is also a human being that might have some certain needs. We're considering closing on one, um, but, you know, but there's also been a lot of startups that are being built around like insuring the crypto wallet or, and this and that as well. Um, we didn't pull the trigger on any of them, but we, we are we have tracked a bunch of them. But I think there's just a lot of unique models. I mean, like the crypto asset class is like valued in the trillions. It's going to be spent somewhere. 
I think I'd be remiss to let you go without tapping into your advice potential. And there's quite a lot of that. The obvious one is if you look at any statistics of female representation we see, or even like women among founders, I think the Matty here in Japan did a survey recently and as few female representation there is on company boards, it's even worse when you get into the startup scene and the number of female founders are few and far between. So What's your advice to the young next generation that might be at least looking at such a career and uh, how to take the right steps to increase the chances of getting in and being successful? I think it's all about how big you want to see the world. I don't think it's one gender is smarter than the others, right? I think there's some sort of general trends of like how people behave, but a lot of times it, like it could be like socialized. And actually, I was just having a conversation with someone about this. It's like, do you have this same expectation for any child to be able to build massive companies for any smaller ecosystem, which is having the expectation? Like if you take a look at like Israel, everyone is trying to build a global company. And guess what? There are so many more global companies, massive global companies coming out of Israel. There's also the ecosystem that supports it. And I think that's the same thing is that we need to set that same expectation, whether it's women or Japan or like whether you're from some remote island somewhere, which is setting the expectation that you will be able to build a very large company. You have to build a network. You have to you know, have the right people around the table to build the, that type of company. But I think it starts out with the expectation. That's what you're going to do. It's like a no limit mindset, basically. Yeah. I mean, you can only, you basically go as far as like how far you want to go, right? That's interesting culturally. It feels a bit like that's the real, that's the essence of like an American approach, isn't it? It is. It is a very American approach, right? Like overly optimistic, think big. Um, but we also have a lot more bigger companies coming out of here because, you know, they're stupidly optimistic. <laughs> and then you also, in Silicon Valley, you have the capital that, that would be willing to bet on founders to do that. I do definitely find that there's risk, different risk tolerances depending on which regions, because we do have uh, investments in several different countries. It's fascinating because then also there's other stats that say like whatever the numbers are, 50% of the startup founders in Silicon Valley are like foreign born. And so they are. They are. I think it's quite high. Yeah, either they're foreign born or they're born to families that immigrated mm -hmm. there. But if you think about like the ones that do show up, it means that they walked away from their home. That's a very difficult thing to do. And then to build a new life in a different country, it must be what is that for? Maybe it's like their vision to do something bigger. There's a certain amount of risk taking that, that comes with this in the first place. And, yes. Uh, I think of Silicon Valley a little bit more as a mindset now rather than just like a physical place. I mean, obviously it's a physical place, but there's this ecosystem that's here in a community that is like, hey, let's move fast. Let's break things. It's okay if the startup doesn't work out. Let's get back up and build another one, right? And having that mentality also gives you the freedom to build bigger things here. Right? It's a little bit more forgiving, but it also comes with like, there's a lot of capital here. Why? Because there's a bit more exits. There's more, a bit more exits and there's more company to, as, you know, angel investments to go into these crazy projects. And then, then because there's more money to go into these crazy projects, it's like more likely for these crazy part projects to work out. I remember when I um, was starting to do some work in Singapore, a lot of the early stage investments when I first started, they were all in revenue. Versus like in Silicon Valley, like typically they would be pre-revenue at the at the pre-seed stage because no one wants to touch a pre-revenue company in Singapore at that time. They, now, now you have a lot more seed investors there. Over time, you all had more exits in Asia and, and these previous founders become then VCs or angels themselves. And yes. that's always been lacking, I think, in other regions trying to build a Silicon Valley-like ecosystem because it's always been the role model. But I think the understanding was a bit missing that you need this churning of capital to actually then facilitate the next generation and that you can't just create overnight with some government funding. But it needs to start somewhere, right? If you think about like how some of the largest conglomerates in being in Japan was built, it started with some version of like government funding, right? And I think I've read that there's going to be a lot of government funding being pumped in. And I think, you know, I think the question for the Japanese entrepreneurs is like, hey, how big of a company do you want to build? Do you want to build something just big enough for Japan or do you want to build something for the world? The second part of advice is also from, from your experience, if you have kind of startups that want to tackle the Japanese market, what are some of the lessons learned from your experience so far that you would advise companies on? 
for the companies who are wanting to go to Japan, I think it's extremely important that you have the resources and the understanding of the culture before trying to, you know, work together with any large corporation, especially a Japanese one, because if you don't have the bandwidth, like you could be running around in circles for a long time. And if you're an early stage company, you will die. So don't do that. <laughs> Be ready. Make sure you have enough funding. Make sure you hire the right people. The language is a very important part. And then the cultural understanding is also very important. Do you think that getting investments like, for example, through you from a Japanese mega insurer aligned VC and there, there are others, of course, that are a similar helps in that? So you're, you're not looking at the market entry first. You kind of try to build a relationship through getting capital on board because ultimately there's some vetting that already happens then and any subsequent Japan conversation you can say look at least we've got a stamp of approval here from your VC and they clearly wouldn't have invested in us if they hadn't been convinced. You know, it doesn't have to be from a Japanese strategic investor, but I do think it helps uh, because there is some level of like, hey, we think this might be able to go into the Japanese market. With that said, we operate a little bit different than the average corporate venture capitalist. So we tend to move a little bit faster. We go uh, a bit earlier and we do take higher risk at MS and AD Ventures. So you will be in Japan next week. What are your expectations, objectives for your visit, which is the first time in a long time? Yeah, I, I'm very, very excited about getting to Japan. Uh, there's a couple of things I'll be doing. I'm running this like women leadership roundtable, and then we're bringing cross-border investors and entrepreneurs together to have a discussion about exactly this topic. We have a couple of interviews that I'm doing over there, and then you know, spending time with you know LP and headquarters, uh, and then just immersing myself into the uh, you know Japanese culture. One one of the things that I'm a little bit nervous about is like I'm planning to run some roundtable discussions, and hopefully uh, everyone will be speaking up in that roundtable and not just me. So wonderful! Thanks very much, Tiffany. Will be great to see you here in person next week. And anybody that's interested to have a conversation, then hopefully this helps for them to find you as well. Great! Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.